All right. Well, let's talk about pain. I'm sure many of you have dealt with some severe pain at some point in your lives. Pain is the most common reason that people go to the doctor. Something hurts, you want to know what's wrong. Pain is caused by inflammation. Let's think about arthritic back pain. The joints where the back bends get inflamed. Sensory nerves carry the signals from the inflamed joint to the spinal cord and then no one experiences what pain is until the brain decodes the signals. This brings up an interesting question regarding diagnostic testing. What do doctors do when pain complaints are subjective? Well, they can do imaging study like x-rays or MRIs. If they're worried about a nerve being trapped and irritated by the bones in the back, they can do nerve conduction studies but there's no conventional way to evaluate brain-mediated pain. Chronic pain is defined as pain that goes on for at least three months, and it's probably more common than people know. 20% of Americans have chronic pain. One in 12 Americans have disabling chronic pain, and one in 25 Americans, 4% of our population, take opioid medications for chronic pain. Let's think about someone who came to our neuropsychoanalytic pain service. Toby is 60. It took his primary care doctor three years to talk Toby into coming for an evaluation. Toby said, Doc, my back is so bad I'll never live without my oxycodone. Well, Toby's feeling that oxycodone was helpful is a common experience that drove the opioid crisis. Back in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, certain experts said that opioid medications abolished pain and they were never addictive if they were given for pain. This became such a force that the American Pain Society named pain the fifth vital sign after height, weight, pulse, and blood pressure. Doctors were taught to prescribe opioids, and if they didn't give opioids for chronic pain, they were risking uh, bad patient reviews. The result was the uh, quadrupling of pain medication prescriptions from 1990 to 2010, and by now a million overdose deaths. This is the opioid crisis. We've dealt with the common addiction to painkillers by stigmatizing people who suffer with addiction. 80% of people who use heroin got started with doctor prescriptions. 3% of people who take at least 200 milligrams of morphine a day die from an accidental do overdose. So in other words, if you get a rash from oxycodone, that's a drug side effect. If you die from an accidental overdose, well, that's your fault. Opioids are a hormone that are, that's made in the brain. Endogenous morphine or endorphins circulate through the blood with receptors in brain sites, on peripheral nerves, gut, immune cells, and many other structures of the body. If only uh, doctors called oxycodone a hormone, Patients like Toby would be less likely to be put on hormone replacement. What else can opioids cause? Well, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, or OIH, is another reason that people go to drug dealers. Here's a graph of what's called opponent process. Every dose of opioid produces the A. The B is the change of pain drivers caused by the effect of opioid medications on the opioid receptors. Pain drivers overshoot. Pain spreads and becomes worse than would ever be seen with homeostatic control. Homeostasis means that pain drivers and opioid receptors co-regulate each other. It's the B process that makes pain so extreme that people are more likely to go to drug dealers for the huge doses of opioids needed to even temporarily control this severe pain. In other words, opioids can cause an increase in pain. OIH is not tolerance. Tolerance has nothing to do with pain drivers. 
OIH increases baseline pain. How common is OIH? Well, if only it was as uncommon as doctors say. In a survey of pain specialists published in 2022, they estimated that OIH occurs one in 10,000 patients, so uncommon as to be inconsequential. To explain why OIH is so severely underreported, I need to introduce you to our neuropsychoanalytic service. We had a multidisciplinary pain service for more than a decade. Internal medicine, psychiatry, neurology and family practice residents, pain fellows who spend a year learning to diagnose and treat pain, and many students got together each week to hear presentations and discuss our findings and treatment recommendations for newly evaluated pain patients and the support persons who we required to come with them. Neuropsychoanalysis combines the systematic observations of psychoanalysis, neuroscience concepts such as the hormonal nature of opioids, and measures things with tests such as the cold presser test to evaluate uh, pain tolerance. It's also called the CPT. I call the CPT the blood pressure of the pain system. You can't know your blood pressure without measuring it, and you can't know your pain tolerance without measuring it. Instead of assuming that all brains are the same, which is what pain specialists do when they use the zero to 10 faces pain scale, we have new patients put their arm in ice water. They keep it there until the pain is so severe that they have to pull it out of the tank. This makes the CPT a more reliable measure of pain than the face's pain scale because it's an empirical test, not an opinion. So I'm so sorry that I've told you that not only is the opioid crisis producing overdose deaths and addiction, but increased pain as a response to opioid medications is a universal response to uh, cutting off pain signals at the receptor, and I'll give you some evidence about why this is so. We asked the support persons who came with our new evaluation pain patients to be our control group if they hadn't used opioids or marijuana. And here's what we found. The numbers on the right are the control support persons, and you can see that the pain tolerance of women and men is identical. The numbers are seconds that they were able to keep their arm in the cold presser tank. Look at what we found for women and men who'd been on opioid medications for chronic pain. We had 254 patients and women were a third of normal, and men were a half normal. This is the B process damaging the opioid receptor system that damps pain. Because we counted opioid exposure in morphine years, defined as one year at 60 milligrams a day, we're able to show the gradual erosion of the opioid receptor system as measured by the CPT. So this is it overdose deaths, addiction to painkillers, and now increased pain from opioid medications. What do we do to remove the offending agent when people are terrified of opioid withdrawal? The key medication is low-dose naltrexone, or LDN. We have, uh, using patient feedback to teach us about how to do this, we've learned to have patients like Toby come in at the very beginning of withdrawal. We use the long-acting sublingual opioid buprenorphine one dose at a time until the withdrawal goes into remission. If you look under your tongue, you see sublingual veins. The buprenorphine goes through those veins into the blood and then to gut and brain, which is what arrests the withdrawal syndrome. Toby left happy because buprenorphine had substituted for his oxycodone. Buprenorphine fades off the receptors gradually over a week. Toby took LDN immediately. 
LDN restores the receptor system. Toby had my cell phone number, called day or night if there's a problem, and medications for minor withdrawal symptoms such as gut cramps or insomnia. Our completion rate is almost 100%. So what does LDN do for OIH? For a group of 55 patients who had an average CPT of 24 seconds, they were restored to 107 seconds, an average of three months after starting LDN. 107 seconds is statistically indistinguishable from our normal controls. So what happened to Toby? Well, he went to psychotherapy on our service for two months. He paid attention to taking care of his back with core strengthening and weight loss. And with the help of LDN, he was sent back to his primary care doctor with no pain. The pain had been brain mediated or due to a lack of self-care. The most common reason that people use medical marijuana is chronic pain. Here's what marijuana does. Compared to a control group of people who inhale nicotine every day, the people who used marijuana every day had a significantly shorter CPT. This is cannabis-induced hyperalgesia. All right, so what have I told you? First, I'm sorry the opioid crisis is worse than you knew because opioid medications make chronic pain worse. The neuropsychoanalytic approach of using systematic observations, neuroscience, such as opioids are a hormone with a receptor system, and measuring things, such as using the tool of the cold pressure test to measure pain tolerance produces discoveries. Short-acting addictive drugs, opioids and marijuana, make pain worse. Importantly, it's important for us to accept the reality of our findings and continue to reduce stigma. We can detox chronic pain patients using low-dose naltrexone to reverse opioid-induced hyperalgesia, closely following the cold presser time until it normalizes. This would alleviate suffering and save so many lives. Thank you.